Superman, Superman Supreme. Extreme Supreme. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So I have to figure out how to get a boot to stay on his head. So anybody who knows who this guy is, he wears a boot on his head. And I bought the boot, and then I was like, I don't know how to get this. Oh gosh, good luck. That's a great costume, though. He's chosen wisely. Otherwise, everything else is that. But I don't know how to get a boot to sit on. That's my stress level for the moment. Understand how to get a boot on my head. So, and if I thought about it, I would have just three D printed one. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. it just that fits perfectly on it but i didn't think about that so. if it helps i once dressed yeah. up as a tool and i did it by making a giant cardboard hammer and put it on my head uh-huh. uh and it, the way i did it is i made it so it came down to my shoulders so it rested on my shoulders and i cut like a face hole in it so it wasn't resting on my head but it was yeah it's, it stayed on all right yeah no we, we were i think it's gonna be a yeah, it's just going to be a little bit of a cutting. I, I got a cheap pair of boots. I got some boots from the thrift store, and so I don't mind cutting them up, but I feel really bad because they were nice boots otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, all right, no, enough about how, that should have been the question. It's like, what, what, what is the worst, ho- or what is the hardest Halloween costume you ever made <laughs> instead of the burnout meter? <laughs> so, um, And I could take the one that I'm trying to do right now. All right, great. Uh, okay. well, we've, we just have a small group, I think, today. Um, yeah, Matt couldn't be here. I said I would lead the discussions. Um, let me put the, um, sorry, the reason that we're discussing the burnout meter, if you haven't already seen the, <laughs> the, uh, agenda. Um, and, uh, I think we're going to talk today about, um, well, we had a proposal to talk about metrics and actions that would provide for universities researchers to help them reflect on their open source work. And I actually just came from this meeting with, um, it's called UC Tech, which is mainly like the technical side of um, university computing. So, and we're actually, we were joking that there wasn't a lot of discussion about research computing <laughs> and university research uh, in that discussion. Um, but uh, but um, Anyway, so that that would have, I, but we did do a session on open source, and um, I know a lot of there was a lot of you know questions about whether or not, like, um, so our one we had a huge question we ended up having was a lot of had to do with security and security of open source projects when uh, when you're working with them, um, in in a university setting. But uh, um, yeah, so it was definitely was something that that um, resonates with me now. It's like having this, this discussion right now. And David Katz did put a um, link up to a blog, which I didn't have a chance to read in, in the Slack channel. So I'm not sure if anybody had a chance to look at that over. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, I guess, yeah, first off, does that sound like a good, still sound like a good topic based on um, based on those who are in the room? And um, if not, if so, then I can just, um, like, thankfully, Matt also did create an agenda that we can follow. So I don't have to think about it. Um, I appreciate that, Matt. Um, and I, th- I think if, if you know, if he's talking about the rationale um, of of this discussion, and I, I do agree. I mean, number one, the first thing to be is this. You know, it's kind of something that I push a lot is when I when I'm discussing this issue is, um, the you know, with funders specifically looking to support grantees, like this whole the, the discussion about metrics becomes important. Um, I mean, it's important anyways, but I mean, like that, that tends to begin to resonate with people, I think, when you start talking about it in in those, um, in those um, terms. So uh, I guess, I guess my question is, anybody have any comments kind of on the, that initial kind of rationale that, um, then some of those points that are put forward uh, for, in, in the, in the, in the agenda for people and if people need some time to read through you read through that um we can hold off uh just and give people a chance to kind of review what's what's on the what's on the list and it would be good i think it'd be nice to go through this the the different metrics that he has linked to once we get um I, when I first read this, I was, um, 
I completely missed the the boat. I, I we've been so focused on just the Nelson memo, you know, mm -hmm. concept of making your projects public that making them sustainable seemed like like why are we even worrying about that? But but I understand Pose and all those projects are like more focused on sustainable efforts. So okay, now I'm rereading it and it makes sense. <laughs> Keeping it into the <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that the, that that was definitely um, again something that's been resonating on our discussions within uh, um, but within the UC network is this discussion, and that actually came up when we did have our discussion yesterday with uh, the greater kind of uh, University of California community on this. Um, who came to our session on on OSPOs, and that was sustainability was a big thing. There was like people, there was a a person who was talking about software they had used and was actually being used uh, throughout a lot of museums. So it was like, an, you know, outside of kind of the typical, um, like this was somebody who was coming from maybe had working with humanities or arts and and those folks. And they basically had so, so, uh, technology that is now complete, not being um, maintained, but that is now throughout like a, a large number of uh, museum networks that are, you know now they've lost the because they, they basically lost the technical support for it um, and now they're like well we don't want to do it so the idea of that now they don't have the money of course because they're just museums <laughs> to, to kind of revamp and so it's that question of like how do you rely on something and that's and that you don't and how do you make sure something is sustainable um so I thought that was a really interesting uh question as well like the, how do you how do you know that ahead of time when you start working with a particular technology that that you're going to it's going to be sustainable in the long term. Um, and what are you looking for when when you're trying to? And that was, like I said, these questions that were coming up yesterday when we were having that meeting with the, the session that we had um, with with the larger UC folks. Um, and there was interesting people, like people from, you know, you know, I, ITS, as well as people from like the CIO's office and somebody from procurement also had the same questions and stuff like that. So it was a really interesting um, group of people that you don't normally talk to <laughs> or that I don't normally. Um, Did anyone have an answer? <laughs> well, it was a yeah, no, not yet, because we were actually so the for that particular discussion, it was we did it as a a boff, and um, so we were just kind of asking the UC community what they needed from us. That was kind of the whole point to the to that boff, like um, you know, uh, anybody interested in open source, come and tell all the open source program office folks who are trying to do stuff at UC, uh, what do you guys actually need from us? Um, and this was one of the things that they said, and we we were, you know, we're trying, you know, with John, Jonathan, the work we're, you, you and I are working on with that a lot. That was actually what the, you'd be happy to know, that's one of the reasons it was, was because of the um, the discovery aspect. We were trying to kind of refine some of the, what we're, what we're looking for. Um, and, uh, but that was just something that came up and, you know, they were happy to hear that it was something we were focusing on. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it's awesome. But no, nobody had a specific. Nobody had any specific. One guy actually, there was one really good one that I would would, would what that I think is imp interesting, and this is something I can see working at the uh, UC network level. Like it's something where you have a larger system. Is basically creating a core, an engineering core with graduate students from across the UC system. So all ten. So it's not just like dumped onto one small group, but it's my like a committee that over um, over the entire um, our entire system that would actually review software. And this is more for like a from a procurement perspective or or like health perspective of whether it would be used within the research establishment or um, uh, and that actually was an interesting idea that we thought like, oh, maybe that's an interesting way of distributing the um the the work with regards to trying to you know understand the sustainability of a particular project or understanding the security and that was a, a little bit in the sense of the discussion was more about security at that point but i mean it, it dev obviously overlaps to the sustainability question so. yeah that's amazing I, there's a couple of initiatives um i'm working with that are doing that uh on a regional level i think you're familiar with a couple of them hey, broke up yeah but I haven't yeah, heard them talk about something like that where it's more like a like a 
you know, a, a core, like a group of folks who are helping to assess within within like a given system or something. Um, and so that I mean, I don't know if OGov is focused on, has been focusing on that or not, but um, I've been missing the meetings. So I, not purposefully, I just <laughs> keep traveling in the middle of them. So, but um, I'm wondering if the um the open source pathways um i'll put it in a link in the chat um i might be missing the boat again <laughs> i feel like i'm missing a lot of boats <laughs> um if this would be a cool metric to capture because i feel like some things back to my original things some projects shouldn't be sustained they're just one and done right. um in the different levels of maturity um and this sort of captures the, the different levels of maturity and maybe there's metrics that can be built or already are built around this. You know, if you get a certain number of downloads in your project, then you're at a certain level of maturity. If you have a community, you know, collaborating and building, you're at a certain level of maturity. Um, or maybe those are the kind of metrics you can start to capture to identify the projects that are should be should be getting more resources from the I like no, I do like I like the idea of that. If coming up with a an understanding of the maturity levels and because I do I, I do think that there's it's they get lumped I think open the idea of open source projects at least in the I feel in the in the university setting kind of gets lumped together a little bit too generally and we don't we aren't it'd be useful to have sort of a gradation of like yeah okay these are how my resources should be managed I know we're trying to do that I'm sure you guys are too in uh, GW um, just right. Okay, what are the projects that we're focusing our attention on? And when we're doing the, um, the scraping of like GitHub and and the like with with Jonathan and stuff, like part, it's not that we're going to look at everything that comes out of that. So we have to like kind of manually go through and say, well, which ones are the ones that we're most interested in? What and what and how are we making that that distinction? And I feel like that kind of goes back to some of this the stuff that's in, um, what, what Matt put in through the the. Um, like, you know, that helped, you know, you want to look at, you don't want to look at for every project. And I agree, it, the one and done idea, like, how do we, how do you just, how do you, how do you deal with that in a, uh, how do you deal with that in a, a useful way as well? You know what I mean? Like, do, do the do things just kind of linger and people find them accidentally? Or do you actually create, you know, create, create something where they, they get sunsetted? And well, there's a huge, it's a huge issue that we have in the system too within our the UC system is like, well, if it has a UC kind of label on it in some way, is it now our responsibility to make sure that it's properly archived and put away if it's no longer being maintained. So I, I think too, some of it, some of it's more um, from my perspective, more around setting expectations. Like it's mm -hmm. fine to have something that somebody creates once that isn't really maintained that, but that people are continuing to use. So maybe it's not appropriate to archive it because people are still using it. Right, right. But right. I think you do need to set the expectations really clearly so that the, yeah. you know, the readme or maybe there's some notices in the software itself that says, hey, this was created for this purpose. It's not being maintained. You're welcome to use it, but you're using it at your own risk. Right. So I think I think that there's, you know, like to David's point, there's nothing wrong with those kind of one and done bits of software. But I think you need to be clear that that's what it is, especially right. when it's in one of your organization repo or organizations as a repository. Yeah, that's a really you guys good see, yeah. do, do you guys see RSCs playing a role here in the just building up sort of a knowledge base of what exists in the open source, let's call it a market, so that when someone comes to them and says, hey, I need a one and done project for my research, maybe the RSE can say, we can do that, but there's also this other tool that's like 80%, we just need to get a couple PRs merged probably to make the, the functionality what you need. Why don't we contribute back to this core project that already has a community instead of building one and done for your single one-off project. I know that the invest in open infrastructure group, uh, the, I, I, I never heard of this, um, uh, whatever, uh, God, what's, uh, that's they it, have a, IOI. A yep. list. Yeah. The list. No, but with the, the list that they have, it's, um, I'm blanking out on what it's called. Like it's a, it's a repository of infrafinder. Yeah, 
That's it. Thank you. The Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to remember the word for. It. And that I actually, I, I mean, I, I feel like that is a really, I, mean, I haven't gotten it, looked at it very deeply and I hadn't actually heard about it until last week. So I thought that was actually a very interesting um, uh, thing that to be used by like either RSEs or, you know, people in in open source in universities and anywhere actually but specifically like universities because you know that is the question people had is like well how do we know how do we know what's out there and, and whether he's and i do like the idea of like not reinventing the wheel um instead maybe just borrowing something that somebody else used and building off of that if necessary but yeah with like what don said with the understanding of the limitations of whatever you're you're using and whether or not it's being maintained or um kept you know, kept it up to date. Um, I don't know, what other people, other ideas? Are? Oh, I was just gonna say, and depending on the, you know, the skills that the folks in your OSPOs have, I mean, this, this really can be a value add for your, for your open source program offices is being able to, to help people find these alternatives and, and navigate this because the default, the default is always, I can just create a new thing and it'll be great. Um, or why don't you create this new thing for me and it'll be great. And um, I think a lot of times they they really don't they really don't know what their options are. And I think an OSPO can help them navigate those waters. Yeah, I think that's a huge part of what we're trying to we're trying to I don't think it's something that we thought about at the very beginning of what we were doing, but trying to like go, no, you really don't have to create something new. <laughs> you can just go become part of the community. That's and it's actually something that we were again talking about with the larger UC community is how do we support people becoming part of communities as opposed to just working in like creating an open source project and throwing it out there. And it's like, can we it, we can yeah? How do we direct people better? Um, so yeah, no, Jonathan, I think that that's maybe a great like an RC with or, and and an open source and, and you know an OSPO in general could be really good uh you know tool for that type of activity yeah and they can use something like moss <laughs> <laughs> they're making it's a really big map as you call it <laughs> um but yeah i mean how does how do you feel like something like the infra infra finders like i said i haven't used it yet so or really uh how does that fit into that? Well, how would you see that? Since you are more, you know, some of you seem to have been in, used it more. Interfinder, my understanding is more about infrastructure projects and less about software that will help analyze a, an array of data or something like that. All right. So I, I just, the, the one thing that they're working on, and this is what I, how I heard about it, is that they are looking to integrate more metrics and into including the chaos metrics into and I don't know if it's directly into this or kind of a spin-off of this and that's part of the uh the project that they're working on right now on um the di the diif funding that they got has a has, has a focus on that so that's why I'm actually really interested to see how if you could have something like this that has like finding uh, if, uh, and this is, yeah, you're right, this is specifically infrastructure, but if there was something that, that we had that was like this for a large, or, or a number of different ones, so different projects, um, you know, depending on the category and the type and the technology involved, maybe could find, could be found through this type of tool. Yep, that's what we're building. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, any other thoughts on on that with regard to sustain or how yeah finding and sustainability and um and for and also like how do you who are you if you are going to recommend someone using a specific software as opposed to building their own or you know or you want to push them how yeah what is what are the what are the metrics that you're going to be looking for and how do we um so yeah, what are the metrics for that. sustainability? Sorry, mm -hmm. I've, I've, my brain doesn't really start up as fast as I would like it to, which is one of my problems I'm realizing. Okay. Okay. Um, so it sounds like 
Could, could, could you repeat like what exactly what kind of metrics you would be looking for um, or, or, or what you're looking for us to say back? Because to me, it sounds like you're saying. If you're looking. No, wow, it really it's really not starting. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts around metrics that I would find useful when I'm looking at yeah, what, maybe that's, what, what is sustainable for a project yeah. and what does that mean for a project academically? So a good example would be um, a qualitative response that you could find out saying how many people in your field depend upon this tool for their work, right? You can't just use numbers. You can't say 10 million people use this project and therefore it has to be sustained. But something like, no, every single person working in um, this particular type of cardiovascular imagery has to use this tool. Otherwise, we have no other tool. So that would be a really interesting type of metric. Um, yeah. And something beyond, say, just, you know, 10 million people use it. Another interesting metric that I've been thinking of while listening would be something like, what's the narrative for the project? And is it defined by the users of the project? Right? Do they have anyone at the project who's able to talk about why it's important? If they don't, it's probably not important. Um, if it's not written in the readme, it's probably not important. So that's like something which I would find relative or uh, and find important for an open source project. Um, if it's just a tool that's out there that isn't clear for how to use for anyone who's naive, then it's not gonna be used in the long term um, because they haven't figured out how to tell that story yet. They haven't figured out how to get funding yet. They haven't figured out how to communicate elsewhere, which means that it's not going to attract new people on its own. Um, so like those are two things I was thinking of, but I'm not sure if those are the right answers for yeah. what you're thinking no, or I mean, I'm just sort of no. fluttering around in space. No, no, no. I mean, I think you made a great good point. I think that hit, that hits, uh, I think the idea of the qualitative numbers as opposed or so not quant numbers, not, not numbers, but not thinking of them quantitatively, but maybe qualitatively, I think is a way, I don't think people, that's a really good point that I've not, not heard put quite that way before. So I thought that that's actually really helpful. I'm not sure if I'm like, I feel like the stories is important and de definitely important, but the idea of like, if somebody's not got them out there yet, maybe that's part of what, if you're supporting those, if you're like, it's like, let's say it's a university based group and you're an OSPO, it's like, how do you, do we help them find those stories? And like, just, are they just not, they just don't understand how, how to, to tell their story yet. Um, again, that's kind of different. Yeah. Uh, let me let me just frame this a little bit differently because um, I, I think I know what Matt was trying to get at when he put all of this in the in the document, which is that we uh, within the chaos project we've been creating these practitioner guides. Now the practitioner guides are really designed, and you can see the example linked here, right. the organizational one. They're they're laser focused on people who are relatively new to open source to help them get started, and so so they have a very specific format, uh, three to four metrics, no more. Um, and the metrics actually, I'll be honest, like the metrics aren't actually the most important part of these guides. Um, what I would say is important about these guides. So let me just give you the context about the guides and then let's talk about what yeah. this means to this, this group. Thank so the, <laughs> so the, the importance of the guides, I think, is that first they start by, this is the organizational participation one. You know, it starts by, kind of framing why you should care about this. So in the context of what we've been talking about, maybe it's why you should care about having sustainable research projects. Um, I don't know, we can, we can figure that out. And then it has a section on trends, which is the bit about the metrics. So here are some metrics you can look at. Here's what it might mean when you see this going on with your, with your metrics. So we talk a little bit in each guide about, about what the metrics might mean. Um, and then we talk about how, how to think about them in the context of your project. So, so we, you know, we talk about what the metrics might mean. Then step two is actually diagnosing things. So like, what, what does it mean when you see, you know, for example, something, something like this. And so we talk about that. There's a little section with some additional metrics if people want to go a bit further, but the real magic of these, uh, practitioner guides is actually step four which is what do you do to take action on this? And not just what do you do to take action on it, but here are some specific things that you can do if you're trying to improve this, you know, whatever the topic of the guide is. So if you're trying to improve, um, you know, organizational participation. So here's here are some things that you can think about doing. 
And so the these practitioner guides are really written by people like me who've been doing this for a really long time, who kind of know what these things are, um, but that someone who's relatively new to the topic wouldn't. Um, and then there's some, you know, caution considerations, additional reading, references, you know, that that sort of thing. So that's that's a practitioner guide. Um, and then coming back to the um the topic. So what Matt was trying, I think what he's trying to get at with all of this is. What would it look like if we created a practitioner guide focused on um, university researchers to help them figure out what to do with their work? Whether we focused it on sustainability, like we could decide where to where to focus it, but what what would they need to know, and what metrics, what three to four metrics, um, could they use to get started? With, with this topic. So I think that that's kind of what, what Matt was getting at. And he proposed a few, and I'm pretty sure that he actually um, did some work on this, <coughs> excuse me, a while back ago, because I think we have an issue, um, which this may or may not be the right, the right topic. Let me throw this in the chat. Um, oops. So he, he made one suggestion, which was sustaining or sunsetting open source research projects. And we could maybe do a couple of a couple of guides. So, so far, none of the guides have been focused on research projects um, or research in general. They've all been things that every open source project can benefit from, how to think about contributor sustainability, responsiveness, organizational participation, and security. So those are the four guides we have now. That applies to everyone, right? That's not specific to any particular topic, but we could do a couple that are specific to research. And if we decide that this practitioner guide format just doesn't work for you, we can make a whole different kind of guide. So that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out within the chaos project is how do we create guides that help people from different contexts or different, you know, whatever, use our metric in a way that they can actually do something with them because that's always been our challenge as a project right we've got we've got a pile of data you know metrics definitions um we have software that helps you collect that pile of data for your project and then we just turn them loose they're like oh good luck hope hope you can figure all that out on your own and so that's what we're trying not to do now so we're trying to give people a little more guidance so i think this is what matt was trying to get to get at with with the um, with this was how do we how do we um, define a couple of metrics that might help people get off of zero and and get started. But you know I'm I'm not an expert in the university systems. I don't know what those metrics would be. I don't know how we'd get started, and I don't know where the right place to focus is. But I think that's what he was hoping that we'd get out of this meeting. That makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Okay. One of the things I'm worried about. Um, and you've seen this before, Don, I, I think, is creating a guide for people that don't necessarily need the guide. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, are, are is there a group of researchers who are working on open source projects who don't understand what sustainability is, who don't understand how these things work? Because um, to me, that sounds a bit unrealistic. I, I, I think what might be a good reframe for a guide like this for researchers um, might be if you're a researcher who has done some open source work, uh, what, what's a guide that you could use um, not to get up of zero, but to increase something, some other metric that you want to increase. So something that I'm not seeing here, which if we're talking about researchers would be really important is citations. Are you gathering citations about your project? Um, are people using your, your tool in research? If they're not using your tool in research, it's unlikely that it's going to, you're going to be looking in academia for funding for this thing. Otherwise you're gonna be looking for funding somewhere else. You're gonna be looking for other, other solutions. Um, and so there are ways of getting research. There are ways of finding out how many citations have used your project. And that might be a useful thing to write up in a guide, right? Um, how do I know how my tool is used is a common question that I've heard from other people. Um, and so that might be useful, um, but I don't know if that's the kind of thing that that's wanted here um, because I'm not, it's, it's always unclear to me when making a guide for people who haven't shown up, like who you're making it for. 
Yeah. And I, I would say that maybe the audience for these guides is um, academic OSPOs who plan to use the guides to help the people that they work with. Because one of the one of the nice things about these guides is they're all MIT licensed. So you can take it and fork it and make some tweaks to it based on what your OSPO is trying to achieve. Because that seems like the right place to start because Richard's absolutely right. Like creating guides for people who don't want or need the guide isn't gonna help anybody. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna waste our time. So I think we need to think hard about who's gonna use this guide and how they're gonna use it um, before we start. But the other piece of this too, I think, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about funding for projects and particularly in this space, there are, you know, a couple of organizations who are doing a lot of funding in the scientific space, you know, CZI, for example, uh, Sloan funded a whole bunch of OSPOs. And what, what are the hot buttons for the funders right now? Because one of the things that I do hear is that you know, projects get funding and then they do the thing that the, you know, they committed to the funders and, you know, then what? And then they run out of money and they don't know, they don't know what to do next. So what are some of the expectations of the people that are giving people money and, and what, what would help projects better use that money in a way that they can sustain it afterwards? So I, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that that's a guide on that topic, but I think as we're thinking about guides, we should be thinking about how the funding is is tending to come in now and, and what the expectations are and how we can better help people not only get that funding, but then, you know, sustain their projects after the funding has gone away. Yeah, I mean, I think that that I think what you're talking about with the, I mean, I get both point the Richard's point about, you know, not you know, making sure we know who the audience is. Um, and I do think that OSPOs, I know all the OSPOs that, that we work with would, you know, are still kind of trying to figure out their, uh, you know, a lot of these issues. Um, and, but I, uh, I, you know, and what we are all kind of concerned about that, you know, project cycle issue. I mean, that comes up all the time and the funders and understanding how to present it to funders that, yes, we do have a, a plan for projects and we as a not just we as the OSPO is something coming through us but that our the projects that we are supporting or servicing in other parts of campus would be uh would that we are are able to give them some sort of guidance on how to make sure that it just doesn't like end at the end of the of the the funding cycle and I think that that's I agree that that's something that's there's more attention to I just and I still don't feel like there's a lot of answers out there for people so if that was something I definitely see that that would be uh, a very important like a uh, piece of like yeah, a tool or something that 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 could be worked on and and provided to people and whether that hits I'm not sure how the metrics fill in but I feel like there should be like metrics on what people are thinking about like are you thinking about um you know the next steps and and are you like what are the next steps and what are you measuring now to make sure that you get to that point once the funding cycle is over. And that should be something that would be at, probably at the proposal stage, um, being able to see that, that, that there's at least a thought process being put in. So, I mean, can that fit into a, a, a practitioner guide or is that like something that's a separate, I mean, I like the idea of a practitioner guide from the OSPO perspective of like something that we can, we can tap and then we could also show our researchers so they have a better understanding of what they're, they're needing. Cause it's not like, we're not all putting in all the funding. Like I'm not necessarily going to write every pose proposal, but I am going to support every researcher who's doing that. So having something that we can point to to help them, I think is useful as well. Yeah. And we can, like I said, you know, if, if, if it fits into the practitioner guide format, we can use that. If we think it's another, another sort of format, we can, um, you know, write some other kind of guide, but, but the thing that I hear over and over from not necessarily in the research space, but just people in general who are getting funding for projects is, you know, yeah, I've got this open source project. I got this funding. I did all this stuff and, and the community never showed up to do all the work. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's, this, I think, this expectation that people have around open source projects that if they open source it, if they build some stuff that everybody's just going to come and participate and they're going to have this gigantic community. And, and then they're really disappointed when their funding runs out, they don't have a community and now what? And so I think I think too helping people understand understand the expectations, uh, realistic expectations, but also you know how how to build that community if that's if that's what they want. 
And we can leverage some of the other practitioner guides too, because we have one that's all about contributor sustainability. So we can, we don't need to write a new guide about that. We can point people to some of these other, these other guides, like in particular in the research space, I think responsiveness um, and contributor sustainability are particularly important. So we can, you know, we can link to those. We don't necessarily need to uh, redo that. So like here, like, you know, contributor absence factor and new contributors, like I wouldn't necessarily put these as metrics in this guide. I would maybe link to the other guide um, because the other guide has all of this, all of this data. I, I, think, I think you, uh, really quickly, I think you highlighted what a great guide would be for this world, which is expectation setting and just kind of storytelling of what is possible and what typically happens and uh, other sort of situations. So you, um, you're creating open source software for your research project. Well, you could end up creating a really useful open source tool that's used by a lot of people. And then you're gonna be struggling to catch up with sustainability. And then here's a use case, here's a story of when that happened. So maybe think about some sustainability potentials early in the process. And then the other side of that is you might try to create an open source tool that's used by many and has a sustainable community, but it turns out just creating a community is not something that typically happens. That takes a lot of work. So maybe put that community building process in your early proposal so you can have funding for building that community with your tool. I think that would be incredibly useful, the expectations guide. Yeah, and I was going to say also the um, kind of further to that and uh, Don, Don's point about like you of having existing guides, there it would be something within like the academic re or the researcher guide that you where you add the, you know, the difference that, you know, typically comes from, you know, how an a, a outside academia open source community looks at this and how um researchers may look at this or because you how you deal with contributors and how you interact with um your community it does there is a i think a level of there are differences with when you're dealing with the academic research resources um you know other parts of the open source community so i think that that would be something that'd be really interesting to have in there so i think that the you're know, linking just straight to the other um you know, existing materials is it would is very helpful and and useful, but then ha also having a little like caveat in some other documents as well. And then for academic, you also will probably have to think about this. So I is that I agreed like setting expectations is helpful. Um, I mean, I don't know. I feel like a, something like a pr practitioner guide. Um, the idea of that makes a lot of sense to to me. So um, for at least for the OSPO side, and then for the um, for researchers, I. I, I don't know, I'm kind of in the, uh, in, I feel like there is still like a lack of understanding in, for academics who are working in open source, um, that having a guide for them specifically, um, outside of the OSPOs, that being the actual, you know, people working in it, that practitioners, people are actually doing the, uh, doing the creating, um, would still be pretty helpful to answer a lot of questions that we have, or that, that we get, that's what I should say. I'm wondering if in this guide that we have for open source academic projects, um, not just telling people how to set expectations, but like it'd be good to set expectations to the people reading it about what community looks like in academic open source. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, Vue.js has meetups all over the world and millions of people it's not going to be like that for an academic project. Like one other maintainer is a massive win. Like that's it. That's your community. That's that's what you're actually kind of looking for. Um, someone else to help along who's not part of your lab is a massive win. Um, that is a community. That's that's about as close to sustainability as you're probably likely to get for a lot of these sorts of projects. Um, so saying that explicitly might be really useful, right? Saying that, like the community looks different in academia versus industry. And I keep coming back in my head to to the idea that if you're building an open source project in, in academia, you need to be really intentional about how you gather stories of impact. Um, 
So if you're in a company and you justify your bottom line, you don't necessarily need to tell your stories. You've always, you already told it to your manager or, you know, your funders in case you're a VC funded, et cetera. But if you're an academic, um, you need to write somewhere like in the repo or on the blog, you know, this was cited here, this was cited here, this was cited here and show continuing usage over time. Yeah. Um, or, or to say we had someone from Microsoft work on this project. That was a big deal for us because it shows that, you know, things are happening. So like finding ways to highlight those are going to be really important. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if that's a different story that's worth putting in a guide um, for this sort of thing. And that's something that I would imagine an Osbo helping out researchers with. Right. I think Richard's brain is fully operational now. <laughs> um i i i have i have a lot of similar thoughts about that um i was thinking maybe um there this we want we want all the same guides that everybody else wants from a research perspective i was i was listing a bunch of use cases um when to start a new project and when to add features to an existing project how do you make that choice how do you identify a community of of interest how do you grow a community what are the expectations a maintainer has these are all things that i think are everybody has the same use cases potentially but where researchers or academia really is challenged is the transient <laughs> turnover piece of it you know the grants are have a short term often the students are leaving and as soon as they get a job they're they're done um so you know how do you address or overcome that I think we don't, there isn't enough out there. Uh, maybe this kind of gets in, I mean, uh, David, you pointed, you, you noted it as well, but I don't feel, feel like there is enough out there about how to integrate your projects into larger existing communities. And I don't think enough academics, because this in some ways solves some of the, we found it for a project we had actually didn't 100% solve, but it helped minimize a lot of the uh, sustainability projects, uh, issues this project had because it got, integrated into a larger community. And so we weren't as worried about, you know, the turnover of graduate students because it was it was in a community. And you still need to, there's still a little bit of fostering, a little bit of like sustain uh, maintenance that needs to happen on our end, but it really, you know, reduced that amount of the impact. But I, I, don't, I don't really feel like there's enough of that discussion as well. Like that should be like a guide on, yes, yeah, so you don't have to just start it's again, you don't have to start from scratch necessarily, and you don't have to be the only, you know, well, there's some level of like, how, how do you, you know, what are, but what are ways of finding that and doing that? And you're still working in open source and you're still, you know, having an impact, but it's maybe a, an easier way of having impact. Yeah. That's what we were talking about earlier too. And, and that's, yeah. I love that. Like that's, that's where I think the secret sauce is, is all of our OSPOs working together to amplify the effort instead of duplicating efforts and having our silos. If we can break down the silos, if there's a practitioner guide for how to break down the silos, yeah. <laughs> please help, 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 help. I know. Well, so there's... One thing... sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Okay. No, you go. One thing that academic open source does differently is it does have these buckets where you can generally throw stuff. So it's not just putting stuff on CRAN, but there's things like our open sci, right? where if you write a package, you want to just have it be part of that community in the long run. You don't want to keep maintaining it yourself because they will have centers and help. And so talking about this explicitly in a guide saying, can you identify communities of practice that already exist in academia to help maintain the project going forward? And it's actually not a loss for you to lose having it in your own name on, on GitHub. It's actually better to have it to be sustainable somewhere else as long as you continue to capture that you originally created that and that you know the work is still is still helpful towards your career because that's kind of the, the real issue with 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 those communities right is once i i make a tool then hand it away to someone else i lose the ego boost of having be able to say it's my tool but it this guide could say that's not necessarily true you can still gather those insights elsewhere what it does help you do is give your work more legs so that you can then tell more stories about how successful it is for your career. Um, so that's that's something that I think is different about science, like is those sorts of communities of practice um, just tend to work a bit easier 
um, largely because of the underlying work of people who built them um, mm -hmm. for this purpose. One so, one caution I would have, um, because we're talking about a lot of different things here. Um, for the chaos guides, there really needs to be a tie to metrics. Otherwise, you should take these concepts and create guides off in OSPO++ or some of these, some of the other organizations where you're doing kind of more general university OSPO things, um, you know, or even like more like to do groups. So we do need to, we do need to just make sure that we're not trying to do all the things and all the guides within the <laughs> chaos project, because we really, we really should have some, some focus on, on metrics and learning from those and doing something based on that. So just, I just want to pull back a teeny tiny. No, and that's a, that's a really, that's a really good point of like trying to like, okay, we just had this conversation. We could go take it to curious the next meeting. we have. Oh but yeah, like, curious. That's that's what I was looking for. But if, if, um, if you want metrics, just citations. How open yeah. is your work cited, and how are you gathering that? And also collaborations with industry. What companies or employees from other companies have you worked with? Or other universities, right? Just collaborations are just more important than science. Yeah. Before we move entirely away from this, uh, I. What I was going to say is very similar to what Richard was going to say. Uh, and in addition to all of that, there's unifying organizations that are starting to emerge that expand beyond the OSPO, uh, that try to build a core and satellite model so that it's easier for someone to find a community which they might want their package or, or tool to eventually merge into right in the beginning. Uh, to make this so to make this whole process easier and then we can tie that to community health metrics directly by in the guide showing a new uh, researcher who's just getting into open source how can you assess a community to determine a is it the right community for your tool in terms of scope b is it a healthy community that accepts new projects and helps new people integrate into their new into their community, and there's probably C, D, E, and F, but those are two really big ones uh, that metrics would help with right off the bat. I think, are we uh, over time now? I know, I always forget this, this one goes into 9.50. Okay, yeah, or to yeah. 50 minutes after the hour, sorry. Um, cool, was there any last minute then like wrap up things? I mean, I think this was useful. Once, once we, Don helped us get back on track. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just have more insight into what Matt was getting yes. at. I would also I, say I tried to I tried to catch up on the notes because I realized no one was taking notes. Um, no, I'm sure yes, I missed I'm stuff. Sorry. So things that you said that didn't make it in the notes, just add them. That would be super helpful. And we um, are recording, so we have the. I like what Jonathan was saying too. Um, and and we have a something similar right now where somebody developed a, a survey tool. And they're trying to like figure out which journal to publish in. And I said, oh, the journal of open source software. And they're like, well, you know, that's a diamond access. I wanted to get, I'm, I'm trying to get tenure. I need my prestige. So they're going to like pick some, you know, chemistry or something and try to get their survey tool, which is a completely generic survey tool that's open source, you know, in one like little discipline. <laughs> and it's like, there's got to be a better way. You know, I'm not sure if, we can help them with metrics or practitioner guide or all of the above to help them, you know, and maybe they should have, <laughs> to our early point, should have added features to an existing survey tool, tool rather than building yet another survey tool. But <laughs> no, it's a, these are the questions that no we're facing. All right. All right, great. Well, thank you for everybody. Um, any last thoughts or are we all good um i appreciate that recording i i may add notes once i have a chance to review it <laughs> and um thank you to matt if he watches this for making a really good list of things for us to talk about because it did to help definitely um all right great anything else all right otherwise see everyone at the next call thanks everyone Bye. see you
Some idea. I don't think so.